Well, I guess the way that our church would define Lutheranism would be that we are evangelical, sacramental, confessional, and liturgical. So when we say that we're evangelical, we mean that we're, we mean that we're centered on the evangel, the good news that God has intervened into the human condition through his son to save us from sin and death. And that that good news, the gospel, is the central message. It's the most important thing about the Lutheran Church. It's the most important thing that we as Lutherans believe. Now when we say we're confessional, what that really means is that the Lutheran Church is, or at least should be, the Lutheran, the part of the Lutheran world that I'm part of, um, views itself not as this new invention, but views itself as a continuation of the historic Christian church. So for example, we confess our faith according to the ecumenical creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and we also confess our faith according to what are called the Lutheran Confessions. Those were the confessional writings that were written in the 1500s, which served to set Lutheranism apart as a distinct confession of faith from both the Roman Catholic Church and the more radical elements of the Reformation, those that have become more reformed or more um, Baptist-oriented groups. And then when I say we're sacramental, it means that we view God's Word and the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper as the means through which God shows and gives us His grace. Those are the means through which God gives us faith and then forgives our sins through faith. And so those means of grace, the Word, baptism, and the Lord's Supper, those are the centers of our lives of faith and they're the center of our worship life. And then for our worship life then, when we say that we're liturgical, we mean that we understand that God has called us to come into his presence, to be blessed by him, and to respond to his blessings with, um, with our words of thanks and praise in a reverent, Christ-centered way. And so the orders of service that we follow here at Hope and the hymns that we use, those reflect the timeless, um, the timeless nature of Christianity that Lutheranism embodies. So that, um, so that we're united with those who have come before us with many different generations in thanking God and praising Him for keeping His promise through His Word of always being with us. Luther's goal was not to cut and run from the Roman Catholic Church. Luther wanted to reform the Catholic Church to, to get rid of the false teachings that had been introduced and to bring back to the front the true gospel of forgiveness in Christ. It was only after Luther was excommunicated and a price was put on his head that he and his followers established their own church. As far as how Lutheranism would compare to um, Catholicism and Orthodoxy, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to distinguish according just to the word Protestant or not, because in a certain sense, the Lutheran Church is Protestant. In fact, it began the Protestant Reformation. But the Lutheran Church stands in the middle of the Roman Catholic Church and Orthodoxy on one hand, and um, Reformed, Methodist, Baptist, those types, on the other. We disagree with the Orthodox and the Catholics on the role that tradition plays in theology. That we view scripture as the only norming norm for our beliefs and our lives of faith. We are certainly aware of tradition. We're very aware of the writings of the Church Fathers, for example, both the Lutheran Church Fathers and those who have come before the Reformation. But, um, but the tradition by itself is not authoritative. Like if you were to attend my church, for example, you would notice that we have very historic worship forms, but we would not view the historical development of our worship forms as something which holds theological weight in and of itself. But instead, those worship forms are important because they reflect the, the biblical content of our faith. Now the other side of the coin then would be comparing the Lutheran Church to the Reformed churches that all also stem from the Reformation. And that would be, the difference there is that the Lutheran Reformation was a much more conservative one. That, to kind of put a joke on it, Luther did not want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
he did not want to get rid of those things that did exist in the Roman Catholic Church that were good and were beneficial for people's faith and were based on the scriptures. But Luther did want to get rid of those false teachings which had been introduced. But he wanted to keep the sacraments. He wanted to keep most of the historic liturgy according to which Christians worshiped. But one big difference was that instead of telling people that they had to keep on worshiping in Latin and having the worship of the Lutheran Church being one in which people simply watched the priest conducting the service as if it was a show he was performing, Luther put the liturgy and the hymns of the church into the vernacular so that people were able to actively participate in worship so that the liturgy then became a dialogue between God and his people instead of a show that the people watched being performed in front of them. Well, Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic monk, priest, and teacher. He was a professor at the University of Wittenberg. And so he didn't have this, you know, this this great grandiose beginning. He was a middle class boy growing up who then decided that he wanted to be a priest instead of going into law like his parents would have wanted. And so the beginning of Luther's reforming work came down to his discovery that we are not saved through faith and works, we're saved through faith alone. Luther discovered this by going back to the scriptures and he also discovered it by studying the writings of St. Augustine. That um, seeing that the semi-Pelagianism that was prevalent at the time of the Reformation, that was not, um, that could not be reconciled with the scriptures. So that people were being directed both to the cross and to their own piety as the basis for their salvation. Instead of just being directed to the perfect obedience of Christ in life and in death, as the reason why God forgave them and as the reason why God welcomed them into his church, which transcends time. The question of predestination, or the, the, the topic of predestination, I think pretty much comes down to the question of why are some who hear God's word brought to faith by it and are saved, and why are some who hear God's word not brought to faith and are not saved by it. And the Lutheran Church has to say that in a certain sense that is the unanswerable question. We do not know why some are saved and why others are not saved. And the reason why we can't put a neat and tidy answer to this question is because if you try to make the answer too tight, you go beyond what the scriptures say and you infringe on some other important doctrine that the scriptures teach us. Because we know, for example, that God does want everyone to be saved. He does not will some to go to heaven and will some to go to hell. That the scriptures teach us that the will of the Father is that everyone would come to the Son and through Him be saved. And we also know that through His Word, the Holy Spirit is always working in the hearts of those who hear it to bring them to faith, to overcome their unbelief, and to give them the forgiveness that Jesus earned. But we also know that, not, that, that it isn't a situation where some people are less sinful or less inclined to unbelief than others. That the scriptures tell us that spiritually speaking, we all come into this world dead, cold and dead, completely lifeless in our ability to bring ourselves to faith and to reconcile ourselves to God. And so there aren't some people who are easier targets, so to speak, for the Holy Spirit. Everyone is equally needful of God's gift of faith and the forgiveness of their sins, and everyone is equally, well, how do I say this? Everyone needs it equally, and God is working equally hard to give it. But on this side of eternity, we are not going to know why some who hear the word believe it, and why some who hear the word don't believe it. Because if you want to talk about the incarnation on the basis of the Nicene Creed, it's good to come back to homoousius, of one substance with the Father. That at Christmas, we're not celebrating the birth 
of a completely new being in every sense. That even though according to his human nature, Jesus does have a birthday, that according to his human nature, you can pinpoint a time where the person of Christ came into existence. We also know that according to his divine nature, Jesus is the eternal word of God, who is of one substance with the Father, who is just as divine, just as eternal, just as powerful. So that the Savior of the world was not a created being. When we talk about Jesus being the eternally begotten Son of the Father, as the scriptures speak of Jesus, it doesn't mean that there was any point in time, even before creation, where Jesus was begat in the sense of being born. But really, we should understand Jesus' begottenness as him proceeding from the Father, as the second person of the Trinity being the one through whom the triune God has come to the world and revealed himself to the world. The Lutheran Church affirms the Filioque, but I should say that the Ukrainian Lutheran Church, which falls under the historic umbrella of Eastern Christianity, they confess their faith using an Eastern form of the Nicene Creed, which, was, which does not include the phrase that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. That you don't have to say it that way to believe it correctly. Because the Holy Spirit does, because Jesus does speak both ways. The Bible does sometimes talk about Jesus having the, Spirit, having the Father send the Spirit, and other times Jesus talks to his disciples about the Spirit coming to him. The problem the Lutheran Church would see, if you don't affirm the Filioque, would be are you creating sort of a power structure within the Trinity where only the Father has the authority to send the Spirit, but the Son doesn't. But personally, I can see how the Eastern Church would feel a little slighted with an ecumenical creed being changed without a full ecumenical consensus. But I also have no problem with the filioque. I believe it's correct. So the question of, good work, of, what, of what is the relationship between good works and faith is a very important one. The Lutheran Church teaches that good works flow from faith. It's not the other way around. That we aren't able to kind of, we, don't, we aren't given like a little spark that we can use through pious decisions and pious actions to help bring ourselves to faith in any way. Instead, the good works that we perform as Christians, the works which God sees through faith and is pleased by in that way, those can only be done as a result of God first bringing you to faith and making you his child through the forgiveness of sins. But that being said, the Bible does say pretty clearly that good works are important and even to the point where good works are necessary. And I think the best example of this is the account of the final judgment in the end of Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus teaches that the final judgment will be like separating sheep from goats. And Jesus will say to those whom, to whom he has granted entrance to heaven, come you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. And then he gives as reasons for this the good works that they performed. And he gives as reasons for those who are not granted entrance to heaven, but are instead sent to be with the devil and his angels, that they didn't perform good works. Now you might think on the surface there that Jesus is presenting to us salvation through faith and good works, but he isn't. And we see this from the reaction of those to whom Jesus grants entrance to heaven. They say, Lord, when did we do these things? In the sense that they never understood their lives of faith to be lived in the sense that they were earning God's grace for themselves and that they were earning entrance to heaven. But instead, they understood truthfully that they had already been completely saved and justified through faith and the good works that they are performing were simply fruits of that faith. And that's the thing too, is that Jesus presents that picture of the final judgment for us in the sense of things that we can see. 
because God is able to look into our heart. He's able to see if we are his children through faith or not, but we can't look into each other's hearts. And so it's because of that that we can only see the works that we are performing with our actions and with our words. The Lutheran world is not united in the same way that the Roman Catholic Church is united or even in the, in the way that the Orthodox Church is united. Because the Lutheran Church has always been very adept at dividing over doctrinal issues. Now, some of these divisions, too, are not just doctrinal. Some of the historical divisions between Lutheranisms are not so much divisions as they are just different groups of Lutherans uniting because they were a part of a certain ethnic group or uniting because they had a shared liturgical and theological tradition, which was not necessarily exclusive to others. But if you really want to know the reason why the Lutheran Church is divided today, it comes down to the question of what is the Bible? Is the Bible God's inspired word or not? Because obviously, if you believe the Bible is God's true word, which is binding on us for what we believe and teach, then you're going to have a very biblically oriented, very historic confession of faith. But if you don't believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, and that the church is free to kind of pick and choose what from the scriptures will be believed and what will be ignored, then it kind of opens Pandora's box and it allows the church to be carried along by the shifting winds of society as opposed to remaining on the true unchanging foundation of God's word. Now in, in past times, these differences have not manifested themselves in such outwardly obvious ways. But as our society has become a lot more detached from the basic Christian ethic, the differences between those church bodies which affirm the sacred nature of the scriptures and those who don't have become a lot more obvious. Well, I was raised, I was raised a Christian. My father is also a Lutheran pastor. And so I was raised in a household of a pastor, which certainly did not, it's not the only reason why, um, why I decided to pursue the ministry but it certainly was a factor. I would actually say that the greatest reason why I decided to attend seminary was living in the former Soviet Union and seeing the harmful effects of a imposed secularism on the people in the former Soviet Union. Seeing how they had been taught that they were not created in the image of God and their lives did not have an inherent value and how that had such a negative impact on how people viewed themselves. And it also just showed me how there is such a need for the gospel to be preached all over the world, even in those places where it has already historically been preached. Now the process in the Lutheran Church for how this works is that you certainly don't just declare yourself to be a pastor. Those who do that usually are very poor pastors and they don't help people in their faith and their souls. But instead the process for the Lutheran Church is that you attend a university somewhere, and you would almost always um, take in addition to regular classes Biblical Greek and Biblical Hebrew because the Lutheran Church really emphasizes the importance of knowing the Bible in the original languages. And then after I graduated from college, I went to a Lutheran Seminary, which is a three-year course of study followed by a one-year internship or vicarage in a church in which I am kind of functioning as a pastor but with a leash under the supervision of a more experienced pastor who is still overseeing my work and who in a sense is still teaching me even though I'm no longer learning in the classroom. And then after my seminary education was done and my vicarage was completed, the way that the polity works in our church body is that my congregation that I'm still serving had asked the synod to send them a seminary graduate. And so I was assigned to come and serve here in Utah as the pastor of hope. This was my very first call. Well, the desire to become a pastor was based on, um, I mean, there's two things. That, you know, if, if someone wants to be a pastor, that motivation should actually be primarily external. 
It should not be their feeling inwardly this desire to be a pastor, but instead it should be other people who know them and seeing in them qualities that you know a pastor should have, considering them to consider going to seminary. I mean, I mean encouraging them to consider to going to seminary. And so I had people like that in my high school and college times who were telling me, you should go to seminary. I think you might make a good pastor. But I didn't know I was going to be a pastor until I was actually assigned. Because the thing that makes someone a, cler a member of the clergy is not a desire to be a pastor. It's not having a certain amount of education. It's actually holding a divine call to serve God's people somewhere. The greatest blessing is being able to give people Jesus, to be able to shepherd them and preach God's word to them as they need to hear it throughout their lives. I mean, it's especially nice to be able to, I mean, the sacraments are wonderful, to be able to, to baptize someone into the faith, whether it's a newborn who's going to be raised in the faith or whether it's someone who has come to faith as an adult and is being baptized as a culmination of their being catechized. And then training someone and communing them for the first time and then being able to continue to give them the Lord's Supper. That's also a very special time as a pastor or being able to counsel them and share both the joys of their lives and also help bear the burdens that sometimes life places onto us. I mean, the struggle as a pastor is that you become emotionally and spiritually invested in the people whose souls have been entrusted to you. That pastors deeply care about every single member of the congregation, even those people whom they don't see nearly as much as they would like. And so it can be very draining and disappointing for pastors to see people fall away from their flock, and especially to fall away from the faith. Because you wonder, was there something I could have said differently? Was there something I could have done differently? Because seeing someone fall away from their family of faith or seeing someone fall away from God, it's the worst possible thing that a pastor can see. And pa pastors take that more hardly than I think other people do. And so as a pastor, you have these, these highs of being able to minister to people, but you also have the low of seeing people falling away, falling away from God. There are three main reasons why the Lutheran Church has the practice of infant baptism. The first is that babies need it. We don't come into this world as clean slates spiritually. But instead, as Psalm 51 tells us, we are conceived and born in sin. We bear the marks of sin and that we are mortal beings. The second reason why we have the practice of infant baptism is because in the command in the Great Commission, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations through baptism and then through a continued instruction in God's word. And when Jesus gave his disciples that command to go and baptize all nations, he didn't exclude demographics. It includes every single person from birth to death. Everyone can and should be made a disciple through baptism and being instructed in God's word. And then the last reason why Lutherans have the practice of infant baptism is because we don't believe that baptism is just symbolic of something. It is not a way in which we show our devotion to God. Instead, Baptism is the way in which God shows his devotion to us. Because the Bible says that baptism is a washing of new life. It is the way in which God works through his word and the water to wash away our sins and give us faith. Baptism is not the only means of grace, but it is a means of grace. It is a way in which God has promised to give faith and forgive sins, especially in an especially beneficial way for those who are young and can't yet understand verbally God's word. But baptism is not the only way that someone can be brought to faith and saved because many, many, many countless adult Christians in the history of the world have been brought to faith by the word and then they have been baptized as the culmination of their being brought into God's church instead of the beginning. So the question of 
you know, salvation and how the Lutheran Church relates to the other denominations is that it all comes down to what Jesus says. No one comes to the Father except through me. Everyone who believes in the triune God and believes that Jesus is the one whom God sent into the world to save them from their sins, I mean, that's the most basic kernel of faith. And we know that we are not saved on the basis of how well we can enunciate the doctrines of the Christian faith. And so God has not given the church on earth like a line up to which you can come and be saved, but if you go over it, then oh well, you're lost. And so I guess I would say the Lutheran Church, you know, we, we, we completely affirm that, well, I'll say it in a different way. We would hope that as many people as possible all over the world are saved. But we also believe that the only way to be saved is through faith in Jesus as your Savior from sin. And so when it comes to members of other Christian churches, well, we're given a whole lot more basis for that hope because those churches have the marks of the church. They have the word and the sacraments. And God has promised that those things are never going to return to him void, that those means of grace are always going to create Christians. It becomes a lot more troubling in those churches or in those organizations even, which openly disavow the central teachings of the scriptures. Because someone cannot profess to reject the Trinity and someone cannot profess to reject Jesus as their savior and still be saved. Um, I mean, I could even give like a more specific answer that like our church does not rebaptize people who are baptized in other Trinitarian churches. But we would baptize someone who would join our church from Mormonism or from Jehovah's Witness because those churches do not have a real baptism, even though they use water and they use the right words, but they openly disavow the faith and the meaning behind those words. More than half of my church was at some point some kind of Mormon. Some were completely bought in, they were in the temple, some existed much more on the periphery of the organization. And the thing that has always, and the thing that unifies those people who have become Christians in this place is meeting God through the Bible. Whether it was um, seeing as, you know, fully bought in Mormons that so many of the things that they have been taught to believe were not true, or if it was those who were more on the periphery being brought to church by a friend and being exposed to, you know, the Jesus of the Bible and the God of the Bible as opposed to the Jesus that the Mormon church teaches. Because a lot of the names are the same and there's a, some similar story, but there's a very different meaning behind it. That a way, a way that I can kind of describe Mormonism is that it ha it's like a like, piece of Ikea furniture. That on the surface it has this veneer of Christianity but then you peel away the veneer and you see the plywood underneath, you see it's a completely different thing. There are some, some parts of Christianity and even some parts of the greater Lutheran world are very much involved in politics, but that's not the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is not to be involved in legislation. The purpose of the church is to promote genuine righteousness. And it's harmful for the church and it's harmful for the mission of the church when it becomes so involved in politics because then it gives the impression to the unbelieving world that all the church wants to do is to control how you live your life. As opposed to the reality, which is the church's job being to present the gospel to you. The gospel through which God grabs you and then he controls your life and then he guides you in your life. But, um, but churches shouldn't have, you know, ch churches shouldn't endorse pers certain political candidates. The only things that the churches should be involved in are those things which are so closely united to the well-being of people and the biblical standards for morality. So, for example, um, churches should advocate for life. They should advocate for 
for a decrease in abortions and they should advocate for helping women who would be considering getting an abortion to not have to make that decision by giving them the support that they need. But if you think about what causes abortion, it's not women's fault, it's actually the fault of men. Because I would be very surprised if abortion was a very big problem in our country, if men simply had the moral standards to respect women enough to not impregnate them before they were willing to commit themselves to staying with that woman and to raising that child or those children. But the reason why this has become such an epidemic in our country is because men are irresponsible and immoral and they take advantage of women and then they leave women in a very difficult situation in which they would consider doing something which is very harmful for them and then harmful for the child they're carrying.